that brings us next to metadata. And I think metadata is really fun. Essentially, data about data. Now, I'm going to tell a few little stories real quickly, uh, emphasize the importance of metadata. Who all uh, used to watch um, tech TV back in the day? Uh, there was a, a lady on tech TV named Kat Schwartz. And uh, on a blog or whatnot, she uh, posted a picture of herself smoking a cigarette. It looked like this. Unfortunately, when she cropped it, the tool she cropped it with it left EXIF data in it that included the original thumbnail. And that picture actually goes down to about here. Huh. Uh, I'm going to show something similar with a different cat. Another example of metadata owning someone, who's heard of uh, Dennis Rader? BTK killer? He went years and years and years about ever being found. I think he maybe used to use that old technique of like cutting letters out of newspapers to send in to the, the police, to, you know, to, to gloat. Well, he decided one time that I think he sent out a word doc on a floppy disk. But he left the EXIF data in it, and it had basically the name Dennis in it and the name of the church he was working at. So they got him that way. And probably my favorite example is, uh, I guess you pronounce that Dako Anu, or also known as Nephew Chan. Apparently this guy posted on 4chan a couple pics of his aunt. Simon Newton said something about, you know, he'll post more on these certain circumstances. But the guy took it with his iPhone, and it left GPS data in it. By the way, check your phone sometime. See where that's automatically putting GPS data into any photo you take with it. Since it had GPS data plugged in that photo, the people on 4chan grabbed it and says, hey, we're going to tell her unless you dump all the pictures right now. Huh. And uh, so hilarity ensued. And there used to be a web page out there, EncyclopediaDramatica.com, that had a great entry on it. Unfortunately, it disappeared. Uh, the Encyclopedia Dramatica CH, which I showed you earlier, that no longer exists either. However, sorry, this particular page on there doesn't exist either. However, using archive.org, I was able to pull it back an old version from 2009 of this particular uh, person and, the, and tell us a little bit of information about the incident. So that's an example of using archive.org to pull back old information that you know is out there, but it's no longer on the page. Nifty, huh? But those are all examples of metadata. There's tons of different uh, file formats that have metadata. JPEGs have two different ones, AXIF, Exchangeable Image File Format, and uh, IPTC, International Press Telecommunications Council. Now, I'm understanding that second one is used more for like copyright information, like who made the photo and so forth. I'm not a photographer, so I'm not as up on these as I might necessarily want to be. The EXIF data has things like thumbnails, uh, camera manufacturers, shutter speed, various things about the camera, and sometimes GPS info. PDFs, of course, also have metadata, doc files, docxs, exes, XLS uh, files, you know, cell phones, any office file. PNGs, and way, way too many to ever actually name every single possibility. Is there a tool to strip off of the data? Yes, all there is tools, and a lot of times the tool you enter them in the first place, if you go look around the menus, they'll have an option for it. There are also some to be, be careful. Microsoft has some to strip theirs, and it does not strip all the metadata. Yeah, I was having a weird issue with some metadata remaining in mind. Even after I removed the URL, a path in it, it still showed up. Yeah, there, there's a, in fact, if you look at most Windows files, Word documents, and so on, so you can actually go into the file itself and, and get rid of some of it. But there are also some tools that Microsoft sells that for, you can download them to say they'll take that out. Um, and there are even some freebies out there, but I definitely discovered metadata that did not get taken off when I ran those. So you have to be really careful. There's a couple of good ones out there. The really, really good ones are, you got to pay a few bucks more. But, um, yeah, it's amazing how much is on there in the arcade. Oh, there's a lot of good stuff. Lots of stuff. Now, I, inside that uh, direct, that folder I, oh, sorry, that zip file sent there by, that recon pack, I should have a data directory and a tools directory. So these in the ISO safe folder. Mm-hmm. I need Res Hack. I'm going to go open that up. And first I'm going to show you some metadata in EXEs. Actually, there's a couple of ways I could do that. Uh, I could use the strings command. I actually have a version of strings for Windows, but I'm too um, lazy to get it up and running. Uh, so let's actually use the version that is here in a uh, backtrack and hopefully choose a Windows binary that will work. I'm going to do strings and uh, let's see, I think it's on the pen test, Windows binaries, and let's see something that might have strings in it. Uh, hmm, 
Let's go with Scanos. Oh, I'm not sure if any of those actually has good stuff or not. But let's go with. <clears throat> I just scan GUI, EXE, and see what comes up. Here's a bunch of strings from inside there. In C++, what's a string terminated with? A null character. So basically what it's doing is, my thing by default, string will look for any uh, series of printable characters that are at least four long that terminates in a null, if I remember correctly, and that's how it finds these strings. And sometimes you'll find useful information in there, the real words that you might tell you something about the EXE. But instead, I'm going to open up some uh, binaries inside of Windows. And I got to get some stuff straightened out here because I have way too much up and running. Let's see. That's that. Let's see what else we got there. I don't want to see you no more. I don't want to see you no more. You I do need. But I'm going to uh, go into data. All right, underneath data, I have this little exe right here. There's a couple of ways I could probably look at that. I can open it up in Notepad++. Now, I should probably use the hex editor uh, plugin for this, but this will work also as long as I don't save it out. Most of it's gobbledygooch, but there's these manifests out at the bottom that have all sorts of information about it. And if I scroll through this list, you'll notice information here. Like, you want to know what this particular company who develops this tool programs in? Now you have a pretty good idea of that. What platforms they develop for? Little bits of information. Normally you're not looking for this kind of metadata in an EXE, uh, but yeah, it might come in handy from time to time. Probably more, uh, a better tool for doing this and something I use from time to time for developing, um, you know, custom Trojans is ResHacker. With Res Hacker, you can go open up a file, and you can actually dump out the icon from it. This is one reason, pretty sure. There's me. I can dump that out and import it into a new XE. This makes life easier. But if we go down here in version info, we find out some information about it. I'm not even sure what hidden software is, and I don't remember having that anywhere in my source code, but it tells me something about the compiler that was used. I now know this particular tool was written in AutoIt, but I probably could have found that out in other ways as well. In this block, there's also some other information you might be interested in looking at. But yeah, that's a little simple metadata about these EXEs. Uh, something more interesting might be other document for file formats. So let's look at some uh, Word metadata instead. Now, one of the classic ways of looking at Word metadata is just to right-click on it, go to Properties. So that's probably not going to be the most complete view. Uh, go to Details. This is the one I pulled off the FBI webpage, so now you know the name of someone there, when they were editing it, uh, possibly the version of Word they did it, the company it came from. This is kind of what owned the uh, Dennis Rader that I mentioned before. He had this information left inside of the document. Now, something you may or may not know is that all of these uh, types of files, well, I'm just thinking about what I want to do here. Actually, I'll cover it here in a bit. I've got some other stuff I want to show. I mentioned Cat Schwartz before. Well, here's a different cat. This is Dreamsicle. This is my buddy's way, way overly fat cat. Uh, they say that ten, the camera adds 10 pounds. It actually removed 10 pounds in this cat. This cat is much, much bigger in real life. <laughs> But it looks like a fairly innocent cat right there. We can actually pull up some EXIF data on it. And in this case, I'm just using a open view. But I go to image information. I don't have any bio information about myself in it, so that's pretty empty. The uh, IPTC info, at least. Zoom out on that picture a little. Zoom out on it? Yeah, so you can actually see the whole picture. Yeah. One thing. Point taken. All right, you see it's not the whole picture as of yet. You might be able to see some stuff in there that I should have cropped out a little bit further. Uh, but we want to find out more information about this cat. Let's go back to the information. Let's look at the EXAF information. Well, you can see that I took the picture with my, cam my Canon PowerShot. That's all information about me, so you might be able to uh, 
use that for social engineering. Like, yeah, I'm a Canon engineer. We're trying to test something. Would you please install this EXE on your machine? Yeah, that was a little bit far fetched. You can come up with better lies to tell. Um, some information about my camera settings. And if there was GPS information, it would be someplace in here, but that camera doesn't actually use GPS information. You can tell what firmware I was using on the camera. There's tons of information. Uh, though, in this case, there's one extra thing I want to show that OpenView is not showing me. So I'm going to go back to my tools folder. And there's a tool in here called, I think it's EXF Read. And I'm going to open up my kitty cat picture. And you see that the kitty cat is just that little kitty cat that's standing on the floor. However, when I cropped it, much like the other cat, uh, the thumbnail is still the original thumbnail. That's my radical jihadist kitty cat. <laughs> so that's an example of a thumbnail being left in the image even after it's been cropped. Now, some other cool metadata we can take a look at. Uh, actually, ooh, now that I think about it, I have some, uh, let's go to my webpage. It all comes to what order I want to show this. I think I may actually have this in the data mm. folder, and it helps if I type my own URL correctly. All right, underneath the about, I have a couple pictures of me. I can view the EX data on this one. And uh, Ben Thomas made this picture for me. And uh, you see it doesn't really have anything in it. it that one's been stripped. Right, this other picture was taken with uh, a camera of mine. I'm going to view its EXF data. And these are all plugins for Firefox you can use. Writer Editor, Adrian Crenshaw, Byline, iongeek.com. Let's go ahead and display that. Uh, well, actually, yeah, e <laughs> EXIF data is still in there. I just got to scroll down for it. Um, you can tell I took it with my old phone. If you look up that particular phone model, I think it's an HTC Touch Pro. Runs Windows Mobile. Keep scrolling down. You can find the embedded thumbnail, but that one really hasn't changed. And here's some GPAS information. And you'll see, uh, interpret it right, my latitude and longitude, where I am. I can now click on Google Maps and find out exactly where I was when I posted that. Richo's public house. <laughs> it also has the time, doesn't it? Yeah, I believe it also has yeah, the time stamp in there, but I'm known for it. Well, all right, on my phone, my time would have been right. On any camera I ever have, I probably totally neglect the time. But, yeah, in that case, yes. And I'd also say that as a KML file, if I want to be able to put the map inside of a Google Earth. So that's just a bunch of uh, EXIF data right there in that image and uh, where I've been. Let me see. Ooh, actually, I want to show you another thumbnail. Um, let me uh, bring back up EIX, EXIF reader and uh, open up. I think I should take everything out of that one. Um, let me look at... Ooh, actually, no, I don't remember where it's at. I have tons of pictures out there for various purposes. And uh, remembering which particular picture I kept around to show you all the different metadata is kind of hard. All right, I'm geek, uh, let's see, zombies. All right, this particular image. So I showed you a couple different tools for looking at EXIF data. I can uh, right click on this, look at the uh, EXIF data. In this case, you find the original thumbnail has me without all the photoshopping. Let me see. Oh, as far as setting a location on a file or removing it, there's one tool I ha I've been using every once in a great while, uh, GeoSetter. You can use it to actually open up one of these images if it ever actually comes up and opens. Now, this one has some disregard you for now. This one has some uh, information in it, but I can actually get in there, move the pin around, and set it to a different location that I wasn't actually at. Uh, and actually, most of the ways to fake out these no, these uh, these uh, social networking apps to say you're someplace where you're not. Like, uh, Tom Edison, I think, says he likes to uh, check in at Area 51 a lot. Huh. Um, and the uh, zombie uh, museum someplace in, uh, oh, great, I'm trying to think of someplace in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh area, I should say. Monroeville. That's where the Monroeville Mall was from Dawn of the Dead. 
Anyway, I'm yeah. working on that. But you can get in and mess around with the uh, data or just see what the person had happened to take the photo. Let's see. And once you know the location of it, you might be able to find out, okay, let me look at who lives in that area, and I might be able to find out the person's real name. It's all about connecting the dots together. There's no single way that you're going to say, follow the script, and you'll be able to find the dots on somebody. It varies. Oh, um, let's see what else I have on this list. I want to show a different way of looking at some metadata. Now, I'm, how many of you all uh, have messed around with the uh, .docx file format or any of the uh, Office formats? Let me show you something about them. I don't know if this is actually going to work or not. We'll find out. I'm going to open this up in 7-zip. I said I'm just going to try to extract all the files right here. I'm going to do it while I'm open. Essentially, these uh, newer Office documents, the ones that end up in X, or just zip files that have a bunch of XML and other resources inside of them. Now, in this case, it extracted some things I really don't care about, like this XML file. But I can actually open it up and find out some stuff about the document. But that's probably not the core one where I can look at EXAF data. I probably want to go ahead and go into, uh, I'm trying to think which one it's going to be. Back up again. Oh, that one was, I didn't, I didn't see that. Okay, I don't remember seeing that one there before. Let's see. Let's do wood wrap. Oh, there's some of the information you'll actually see in here, though, is, might be older information. I've had stuff stay in metadata that really shouldn't be there, but it does. And you can actually extract some metadata by just going in here and looking at the uh, app information inside of the zip file. Also, you can hide data inside of it that way. But you have to edit one of the manifests to make it not report errors whenever you try to open it up later on. So that's another way you can look at the metadata in some of these. Um, let's see. Because PDF files also have various metadata. If I had a full version of Adobe Acrobat, I could probably see more. But um, here's some metadata from my local ISSA chapter. And uh, see. for whatever reason, it's not coming up in this preview. Probably because the application I have for install for uh, opening PDFs is not the standard Adobe Acrobat one. I'm not sure if the one I have here actually will properly support it. But if you looked at it, you'd find some people from my local ISSA chapter. <coughs> Let me see. This makes me wonder if I have any of the other readers on here. Let's see, this is the NSA one. Let's open that one up. Let me see if I have Adobe Act right in this box. Now I have a Sumatra uh, PDF. There's no thanks. File properties. Oh, the author was Fritz. He was the local uh, president at the time. And a few other details about what particular version of Acrobat it was designed in, which might give you an idea what software someone runs at a place so you know what to send them as far as uh, malware that might actually work on a system. So there's information you can find that way. It's a little easier to find if I had the normal version of Adobe Acrobat in this machine, but Adobe gets on my nerves. Um, let's see, what else was I going to bring up? That's PDF metadata. Let's see. And I always show the radical kitty cat. Now I showed the plugin. There's some other tools for looking at uh, metadata off the web. I showed strings a little bit ago. I was going to show Metagoofer originally, but instead I'm going to use Foca. I'm going to show EXIF data. That's one of the ones I was using for opening up the kitty cat picture and looking at the uh, thumbnail. <coughs> There's also that plugin I was using. It was available from here. There's also an online EAXIF data viewer out here at Regex. But let's play with the Foker tool. tool. Foker is neat because it will do both Google hacking and metadata extraction all in one fail swoop. So let's have around to I eventually get to wherever I need to be. 
think I need to just show me the desktop. Ah, there's FOCA. People ask me, what is that critter? Apparently, I looked it up. FOCA is some kind of a uh, seal. Go figure. <laughs> now, if you have problems running it, you may have to run it in compatibility mode. Though I think you're all on XP boxes, so it probably doesn't matter. Though, regardless, we push all sorts at the same time because it may cause Google problems. But you can type in certain Google hacks and it has a return results scrape for metadata. I'm going to say file, new project, and I'm going to point it at, I'm going to call this project, why did you even pop up? Let's close you. Die, die. All right, I'm going to name this project IG domain iongeek.com. I could add more. Uh, and we're just going to go ahead and say create. It has all sorts of different things you can search for. I'm going to do a custom search here in a bit, but let's go ahead and search all and see what it comes up with for iongeek.com. And it finds a bunch of PowerPoint slides I've done. It's probably going to find some Word docs I've done. There's a ton of different things. I have no idea how fast the connection is. Once it's actually found a whole bunch of stuff, now I notice it, it aired out on one of the search engines. That's okay. I've got enough info right here, right now. Let's click here. Select all of those. And, uh, oh, heck, let's go ahead and download them all. Actually, I could have done that without actually selecting everything. And see how long it actually takes to download all of these into all of a temp. And then we're going to try to extract metadata from them. Oh, 1.2 <laughs> Okay. Well, I'm going to bring up a couple other instances of FOCA. Just so I can saturate it. <laughs> okay. I want to doing it saying, I'm going to go into here. New project. I'm going to call this one ISD. I'm going to do ISD podcast. Oh, I think it's dot com. Let's see, create. Do a search there. And uh, actually, I'm going to do one final one. Just to show you that you can modify it sometimes. Because I don't, sometimes you might have searched more than just one domain. So uh, you may want to search for words instead and find documents related to a word. So I'm going to bring up FOCA, and it comes along, file, new project, and uh, I'm going to call this one Anon, and uh, I'm going to create, notice I didn't even put a domain in, and here's all the things it's searching for, I'm going to customize search, all these different file formats using ORs to separate them. And I'm going to take out the site thing, and I'm going to look for anything a non-ops related. A non-ops is an IRC channel used by anonymous from time to time. Uh, search all. And that's pulling up a ton of stuff. A ton of docs. Now, while it's doing get search, I'm going to go back to the ISD one. It only found a few things, so that won't take too long to download. And actually, I'm not going to select anything. I'm just going to right click and say download all and do it automatically. Now, let's see if I can find uh, IG, that IG one I did at the very beginning. All right, notice that um, I think it's finished downloading everything. I can now right click and say extract all the metadata. I can also just do it from a subset if I wanted to. Uh, so I'm extracting all the metadata from those files it downloaded. We will see what information it gives us. I like Spoka. It's pretty scary. And it's rolling on the I gotta do a lot of stuff like that. Alright, while it's doing it, saying I'm gonna go back to the Adon. And it's still searching, so I'm gonna stop. I probably have enough documents to scrape. I don't need that many. And I'm just going to uh, start grabbing what ones are out there. Uh, it's all Word docs. That's okay. Word docs are good enough. Download all those. If I let it keep going, we got PDFs, probably some PowerPoints, a whole lot of other stuff. 
let's go back to IG for iGeek. And uh, extracting metadata from 40 of 52 documents. And I have PDFs and PowerPoint files, and uh, unfortunately, I've, I've actually gone through and scraped some of them of, of, data, of useful data, so mine's not as interesting a site as it could be. But you see it breaks out the photos into, like, users. This is obviously, like, usernames and full names of people who have edited documents. Folders, which you get all sorts of things. Sometimes you just get, like, URLs. Sometimes you actually get paths. And these are URLs that, of places I visit or are associated with or in one of my slides. Sometimes you get past like C colon something or F colon something. Uh, you don't in this case know it's been A couple different usernames, my full name, my username. You can click on one of these things and actually right click and go uh, search documents where it appears this value. I think the guys who developed this are Spanish, so the English may be a little <laughs> different. Here's the documents where that particular string of metadata appears. Uh, oh, printers. You know, on at least one of these boxes, I have a printer, one of those Microsoft XPS printers configured. Sometimes you find something more specific than this, like a particular HP printer. Uh, operating systems, I, well, Win32 is particularly spectacular, but um, at least one of the documents that was created, this specific one, apparently I was using XP at the time. Uh, actually, that one isn't even one I created. That's one someone else created. I just happened to be hosting it. But that's a bunch of different metadata extracted from stuff on my domain. Let's go instead now and look at um, ISD Podcast. See if there's anything interesting there. Pull all those documents. So let's go ahead and extract all the metadata. But if you do this for a larger company, you'll find a lot more information that's useful than the ones I'm using right now. I just don't want to drop off to anybody that might get massively upset with me. <laughs> Like I said, you find things like email addresses, usernames, <coughs> printers, what software they're using. Ooh, that's something I didn't bring up last time. In the last one, like, this is the ISD podcast, and you click on software. Well, you know Office and Office 2007. You can kind of figure that, though, if it's a PPTX file. Uh, Windows 7 is operating system. And a couple different users. William O'Malley wrote one of them. Uh, Ian Amit wrote another one. And Rick Hayes, R. Hayes, it's Trump Hayes, you find out it's a username, not just the general, uh, not just the general, uh, full name, because of the size of it. And since he wrote five of them, you probably have an idea he might be the guy that's in charge of the site. <laughs> or at least it gives you some weight to that idea. But that's some information we pulled out. Uh, oh, software, and you, oh, we pulled that up. Let's hopefully we find some uh, better information on the Anon one. That one's still going along. I wonder if while it's doing its say, we can do extract all metadata. All right, we're going to extract metadata from the documents we've got so far, because it's got a lot of documents, and it's going to take a while to download them all. Hopefully, we'll get some better examples just from doing this search. And remember, this one is search. It's not based on searching just a single domain name. It's a keyword search. And these are people who claim to be anonymous, right? No, not necessarily. It's people. <laughs> these are so people documents that have a non-ops inside of the document, or somehow associated with the Google search for that document. And that one's going to take just a bit of time to return. So I'm going to step back and see what my next slide is. We'll return to those in a bit. Oh, some more metadata tools. EXIF Reader. Oh, did I put that on the previous slide? Oh, uh, EXIF Tool, that's a different tool. EXIF Reader was the one I actually showed a second ago. Uh, Flickr-Ramu is apparently something for like, automatically extracting data from a uh, Flickr-Ramu. Ooh, Creepy. I'm going to show Creepy off in a second. It's neat. Creepy, <laughs> what it would do is you point it at like a Twitter feed, and it will go out and pull out the geolocations and pull out like images the person's uploaded and uh, try to extract the locations they've been. Also, at least Larry Pesci from the Paul.com team has done a lot of work on metadata. So do a search on uh, using some Google hacks on Paul.com and see what you can find that he's written on the subject. We'll get up to other odds and ends here in a second. I'm going to go back and uh, see how my focus is doing. Oh, cool. Focus returns and stuff. All right. We have tons of different uh, users. So a lot of these are usernames. 
Now, in this case, I switched for a term instead of a domain, but it had been a domain name. That give you ideas of, of a user name for that place. Uh, folders. Who? It's a freaking out. <laughs> Folders. Now a lot of these are URLs. Let's see if we can find anything that's not URL. What? That's a. That's not a valid IP address. Oh, I'm thinking yeah. that not all of that's supposed to be there. But that, sometimes you might find an IP address in here, but you might be an internal IP address that the outside world is not necessarily supposed to know about. Uh, oh, file paths. Like somebody out there on some file server probably has a mapping for S drive, public. Name of the file. So this is an example of file paths. Sometimes you get an idea of the internal network structure here, because I think sometimes you will see like UNC paths for file servers. But tons and tons and tons of info there. Let's go to printers. So some of these places. Oh, actually, this is a better example of a uh, internal infrastructure as far as UNC paths, the different printers that the person's been using to print the documents. That's all nifty. Uh, ooh, email addresses. You know what to do with those. Uh, not these people, of course. This is just an example. You get the idea. Particular versions. Oh, this person's a Mac user. And you know what particular version of Office they were using, at least when they created that document. Uh, operating systems. So on and so forth. So this, 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 Who's this, running that Windows 98 box? So, you know, so, uh, so this gives you, both gives you a ton of information depending on what it is you're querying. It also can find some network data like we were seeing, like we showed before, but I just wanted to show it off for metadata purposes. Let's go ahead and actually show um, Creepy. Let's see where Esther's been. Now, Creepy is neat. Uh, let's see. It's actually a Python script. It's just been wrapped up to where it's uh, an executable for this particular Windows version. At least I think that's how he packed it up. Uh, I'm going to use uh, the Twitter username, Esther Leet. And uh, I'll go ahead and query Flickr also. And I'm going to say geolocate this target. Area user was not found on Flickr. Apparently I didn't set up a Flickr account. I thought I did. But here's some various coordinates and a timestamp of where she's been there. Because of either a Twitter post she made or pictures she's uploaded via Twitter, and uh, Creepy, they're trying to, he's trying to add more and more Twitter hosting services. I think maybe he's trying to add Foursquare, if he's not already has, has it out there. And basically, all these different resources where people use service, social network services that allow you to plug in your, pro, your uh, current location. She's working on, he's working on uh, making it so you can automatically extract them and map out where these people were. Um, this one, I think I was up in, oh, one of these should be where I was up in Cleveland. But just basically locations where uh, Esther has been. All plugged out of her Twitter feeds. And you can put someone else in there as well if you really want to. Also, you can search for people uh, like a underscore ADC. Search for Iron Geek. That's probably me. And I'm going to take out the Flickr ones because it's not going to work anyway. Geolocate that target. And I think I got some stuff for myself out there. It's a big patient. <laughs> but I'm not a patient person. Sometimes you get problems. Now, don't forget, this thing's using Twitter as back end. How many people use Twitter? How often do you get a fail whale? The connection's down. I don't use it often enough to notice. Uh, I do fairly often. <laughs> we'll try to search one more time and get this problem. We'll forget on Ami. But you got the idea at least from Esther. <laughs> Yeah, it looks like that's going to fail also. But that's okay. You got the idea of Esther. So 
Final Call Goal can cover some other odds and ends. Things didn't fit into any of the other categories. Like I said, the class is like a, a mile wide and a couple feet deep. There's so many different ways you can drop docs on somebody. Um, or an organization for that matter. Email headers, or HTTP headers for that matter. Let's say you want to know what web service someone's running. Well, generally speaking, if they're not filtering it at all, you're going to find that out just by looking at the headers. So let's go tools. I think I installed live headers on here. Yep, there it is. Let me go ahead and refresh this page. And I'm not sending, sending any malicious traffic to iongeek.com. That's still doing its thing. <coughs> However, if I go look at the headers, well, first of all, the person who is receiving my headers, they all know what web browser I'm using just by looking at this and what platform I'm using, just from the user agent string if I haven't modified it. But the information that's returned back to me, sometimes you'll see in there the server type, like Apache. In this case, Google Syndication is returning server type as cafe. Hmm, not sure what that one is. I have to look around here for uh, one web that's actually querying Iron Geek for a particular server type. Let's see. QS, that's the server type for uh, apparently FontServe. Oh, uh, well, I got so much traffic going, it's kind of difficult. You can also uh, use Netcat, just connect to port 80, send the right string, look for the head, and just find it that way. So you can look for headers that way. A, a, a better example might be just to look at this particular header that was returned. Uh, GSE, I think I was querying Google at the time. Uh, I think that's a Google search engine. Oh, um, as far as headers from the uh, client side end, if you want to check out and see how unique your browser is amongst everybody else who's using Panopticlick, go to panopticlick.eff.org, and it uses things like your cookie, your particular strings that um, uh, are in your use agent. Uh, let see, things like uh, what plugins you have installed that report that via JavaScript, and tries to figure out how unique and how profile, pro how easy it is to profile who you are uh, it, amongst everybody else in the world. Like basically, how anonymous you are. Like if you're a unique person of a, out of everybody who's ever used Panopticlick, or if you're like one in ten of everybody who's ever used Panopticlick, it'll tell you. Uh, it's pretty nifty. Shodan HQ is also pretty nifty. Um, let me see. Actually, I'm gonna wait on that for a second because I want you to show me that particular tool you were talking about on it. Uh, let's go back instead of talking about HTTP headers. Let's talk about mail headers for a second. A while back, I wrote an article on. Um, Cyber talks talking potential employers, and uh, one exchange of email I had with someone, I was uh, looking at the email headers to see what information I could find about internal infrastructure, and here's two examples. And I basically highlighted the stuff that was interesting. One thing, I realized something about internal uh, IP structure. Like for this one, they're using non-routables internally. That told me a bit of information. I found out stuff like what mail agent they were using, what mail server they were using, uh, this person's user agent string sees different. One time I looked at someone's user agent string and I think it was uh, Emacs, and that kind of definitely uh, raised them in my uh, geek self esteem. <laughs> but from just this, you know, something about the internal IP space as well as uh, what kind of servers they're using for uh, email. But if you're interested in pulling up this kind of data, uh, it pulling up the headers in different uh, mail tools, it varies a lot. But uh, let's say you wanted to do it. Inside Gmail, this is Esther. Let's go ahead and look up. Here's a post I got in Twitter. Let me see. I'm gonna go to Reply, Show Original, and that should show me the headers up at the top. And this is something I got from Twitter. So okay, they're using <coughs> non-routables internally. Let's see. What else can I tell about it? for other really good information. Some place in here I can probably pluck out what kind of server they're using, possibly user agent stream, though I think this was an automated script, uh, scripted uh, message, so that may not be in here. But you can just find a ton of different information, like I was showing you before at the previous page. If you want to find that in Gmail, just go to this drop down, just choose a show original. But whatever mail appliance you got, it's probably in there. Sometimes you'll find the X originating IP, so you'll actually find the IP address of the person who sent it to you. But that, once again, depends on the mail service they're using. 
let's bring up Shodan HQ. We're moving back to HTTP headers as opposed to mail headers. And uh, in here, you can search for certain types of, uh, let's say you, want, you know the certain type of web server that is vulnerable. If you know what it presents in its uh, header strings, you can possibly uh, search for it. Now, in this case, I'm just going to search for Apache. That's going to return way too many servers, but uh, it's not going to show them all on one page, so hopefully I'll just be able to find something useful in the top uh, listing. And here you go. Let's say you want to search for only ones that were Apache 1341, because you knew there was a vulnerability for that. You could type that into Shodan. And find just that information. Now, what I was doing using this for is, uh, or oh, you want to find out certain extensions, only people with certain like PHP extensions, you can search for that in Shodan. That's also useful. I was actually trying to profile people that had hidden sites in IGP based on the header information. It's since created this where they stripped that out. But I was comparing that what the headers returned from inside of IGP versus what it returned from a public facing IP address and trying to match them up and I was actually using Shodan for some of that as well. But uh, Shodan is essentially a search engine for uh, HTTP headers. And it has some other functionality as well. Brian, what was that you wanted to show? Just uh, do a search on VMware. Just like that? In some cases, in this one, actually, maybe we should look for a server VMware. But some of these ones have just VMware inside the location bar, so they might belong to VMware. But that one looks like a possibility. But yeah, for stuff like that, if you know a particular... Um, Do a Linksys. People that have the uh, admin interface out there public. Yeah, you can, exactly. You can search by product. Operation realm. Let's see. Linksys. Know which version of Linksys? What country they're in? Yep. And you actually click on the IP address to go straight to the uh, <coughs> web interface. So yes, good for all sorts of things. A lot of bad information out there. That's one of the scary ones. All right. Another way people profile others sometimes is robots.txt. Don't go to my robots.txt. <laughs> right, here's the idea behind robots.txt. I've actually seen it offered as a security measure in this one uh, ethical hacking book. Essentially, the idea is that um, search engines that respect the standard, they'll look at your robots.txt and they see you list a, a folder, or this is this a directory as, uh, pro, as uh, in there as disallow. It won't index it. It won't put it in the search engine. Hmm. However, if they don't want it in Google, it probably needs some semi-sensitive. So hacker types like to go out and look to see what's actually there. So what someone might do is go out to a robots.txt and uh, let's look at robots.txt for some site. Like uh, let's see if robots.txt exists on uh, IBM. Like they disallow here, here, and here. You might, someone might go out and look at those particular folders to see if there's anything interesting in there. Now, uh, in my case, iongeek.com, what I do is with my robot.txt, I have these folders listed, but then someone will try to type them in and it'll actually log their IP address and redirect it to someplace that scars them emotionally. <laughs> uh, I'm a mean guy. Uh, <laughs> someone uh, once uh, left a message on mine and he put it inside the URL so that I'd see it in the logs. You must be fucking retarded or something like that. <laughs> Not realizing it was a trap. So the next thing they saw was uh, probably over Redenbacher. <laughs> Go home sometime and take a look if you really, really want to. It's pretty emotionally <laughs> scarred. But people will look at these uh, what's that text files to find directories that might have interesting information. So that's another useful little trick for profiling people. Like I said, there's so many different things, there's no way this uh, class is going to cover all possibilities. <coughs> well, it's, it's really not 
the robot stuff that's <laughs> really not designed to be a security feature. But I've seen people claim it is. I know, but that's where they get in trouble. It's really just simply designed to stop these search engines from indexing you. It's mm -hmm. not to be used for security. And there's search engine it is bots not a out there. Tool. There's search engine bots out there that don't mind. They right. will ignore robots.txt. No, 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 no. You just gotta know which search engine it, it goes to. Not a security feature. Security by obscurity. <laughs> Just a simple little thing to slow the crawling. Now, Wiggle database is kind of interesting. This is basically where people have been uploading uh, the war drive information for several years. We actually go out there and look at the MAC address, and this may sound strange. Find someone's MAC address is, you're not normally going to encounter it. Actually, in old versions of Office documents, really old ones, it actually embed the MAC address right in there. So at that time, it would have been useful. But that's a little bit harder now, but I, one time I was watching an episode of Hack 5, and I saw the uh, the SIDs pop it up of the access points where uh, Darren was. I was like, oh, I wonder what hospital he's actually at. I can go out to Wiggle and figure it out by typing the SIDs. If you happen to know the uh, MAC address, you might be able to type that in and go figure out where they're at. Um, I thought I was going to show um, this tool off. Let me see if I got Wiggle um, someplace convenient. Tool. Will. Just a war driver. If nothing, like screws everywhere with his little war driving kit. I got the kit on the IDE. Oh, that's right. I put this on. That, that's the one I don't have in data. I have in tools. Okay. Uh, I giggle. <coughs> Unfortunately. And I'm going ahead and get one by zip file. I'm oh, sorry, by zip code. I can also use lat long. Sometimes I have to click it more than once to actually get a connection. And unfortunately, I also passed your password in plain text because of how they had the signing. So don't use a good password. But it goes out there, it grabs all these access points, and uh, so if you already know the neighborhood someone's in, you might be able to figure out what the access point name is. Or you might already know the access point name and figure out what neighborhood they live in. It's not often that you find out someone's MAC address, of wireless, uh, wireless um, MAC address, or the SIDs, but yeah, from time to time you might. Or if you've got a laptop that you've captured, you can look at it and say, oh, who's he attached to previously? And that information is occasionally useful. Uh, let me go ahead and open up this little KML file and see what we got. Oh, it's saved in that KML file. Mm hmm. And that KML file is a, uh, what do you stand for keyhole markup language? I think keyhole is who Google bought out to do a lot of the, uh, yeah. I think that's the deal. Yeah, that's the original one. And this is any place around the world where people have been doing, uh, using Wiggle. Um, yeah, the Louisville area is a little bit dense. <laughs> I probably should have chose a little bit less. All right, good to say a lot of people are at least using secu uh, encryption on their access points nowadays. The blue ones are ones that are have using encryption. Unfortunately, Wiggle only logs encrypted or not as WEP, so you don't know if it's which variety of encryption. I'm going to turn off all the WEP ones, simplify it. I can click on a particular access point. Ah. Home Depot. <laughs> oh, this one's Linksys. Well, and if they're using the default SSID, you can download that... Uh and pre-computed uh, all the uh, the hashes for the most thousand most common yep. passwords off that password dump against the uh, uh, SSID, so you can just do a, a database, a so real quick uh, rainbow table hack. But here's a bunch of stuff that Wiggle has on all of the access points in my name in my uh, town, <laughs> and you can click on one and find out you know information about MAC address and uh, whatnot. Last seen, you know, you can actually go into my uh, I giggle tool to query wiggle and only say give me my stuff that I found or only give me after this certain date. I copied a MAC address earlier though, just so I could um, do the, the next part. But yeah, I giggle's a little tool I wrote in uh, auto it. And it's fun to play with. You wrote that? Yes. But wiggle is someone else's saying, and of course Google's I basically made a little tie in that could God, combine everything together. Uh, you want to download that? I have that that incredibly long URL. <laughs> uh, oh, Sammy's been messing around. Apparently, Android 
Um, phone. Well, all right, because Google has, one of the ways they do the whole geolocation thing, if you're inside a building, it's not going to be a GPS signal. But if someone has war driving around and, uh, like, one of the um, Google Street View calls come through, and I think they also buy that data from other people as well, it might know about the access point. And based on its BSIF, its MAC address, it may know where that's at. So that's why you get geolocated inside of a building, roughly, based on access points around you. Well, Sammy's made a little tool for querying that information. Like, this particular MAC address is about to pop up. Uh, let's probe it. Is apparently in a... What is this? Germany? In Germany. I copied a MAC address earlier from my uh, Wiggle data. Let's see if Google knows about it. Hey, Google knows about it. Found it in New Albany. Uh, I've actually tried to put in my own information, and I've had some difficulty doing it. I basically changed my MAC address and put it out there and seen if Google would get to it. Cause here's my pet theory. Uh, all right, one of my access points that I've had that I've played around with in the past, um, it, uh, let's see, I had it down in um, Atlanta for a very short time, and somehow Google knew about it when I plugged in its MAC address. But I had it only down there for a very short time, and I didn't think the Google Street View call had come by at that point in time. So the only pet theory I had in my head was that somehow people with Android phones, it was automatically uploading it. Whenever they'd see it and they had a GPS signal themselves, they say, oh, I know what this one is. I'll give it to Google so that it has a log. If you actually go in there and turn on and off, you know, um, geolocation settings inside of yep. Android, it gives you this warning message that seems to indicate that that data is going to be going to them. But I've tried to insert my own, and so far I've failed, and I've tr I don't know if it's because not enough phones have passed by me, or maybe I'm wrong and they're not actually doing a distributed war drive with Android phones. But um, Sammy's little tool can be pretty interesting. And if you don't know who Sammy is, um, a while back, did you hear about that MySpace worm that was basically adding someone to everybody's friends list? That was Sammy. Uh, let's see. A few more links for information on uh, doxing, footprinting, cyberstalking, whatever you call it. They had that huge uh, list of links I mentioned earlier. Also, go check out the uh, P-Test standard and their guidelines. They have a lot of stuff in there besides just the whole profiling part, but uh, they have a significant amount of information on profiling. And there's also, uh, let me back up again, there's a Vulnerability Assessment Code UK, which also has a bunch of resources you can check out. If you want some good videos of presentations people have done on the subject, check out Social Zombies. There's like, oh, I think three different talks on the subject, where they, like part one, two, and three where uh, <coughs> Kevin Johnson and Tom Esten get together and talk about uh, security ramifications of social networks. One that's a little older, but I thought was really cool was Satan is on my friends list. And this is, the, this is by Sean Moyer and Nathan, Nathan Hamill. Uh, this one was nifty because it put forth the whole idea of uh, putting out a fake identity for someone who doesn't participate in social networks so that you manipulate people that do know him. Um... Also, there's uh, stuff that Dave Marcus has done on using social networks to profile your victims. If you want more information on geolocation stuff, I had some failure there when I was doing Twitter and uh, Bing Maps. Go check out his videos on the subject, and it'll give you a lot of details. Uh, these slides will be available later. This particular URL is incredibly Google-friendly as far as indexing, but next to impossible to type in yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're wrapping up the class pretty much. I just want to announce a few events. We got DerbyCon coming up September 3rd to October 2nd in Louisville, Kentucky. The Louisville InfoSec, which is happening one day before that, and a bunch of other cons I recommend giving a shot. SkyDogCon hasn't actually happened for the first time yet. I hope it's coming up. DojoCon, which uh, Mark JK has got another job, so I don't know if Joe Dukan even exists anymore, but I'll have to find out for him later on. HackerCon was fun. Uh, <coughs> I think three or four geeks put that one on. Freaknik, which I usually go to every year. Not a college, it's up in Cleveland. And Out of Zone, which is, uh, well, that's way down in Atlanta, which is a bit far for you guys. And finally, questions. Probably turn the lights on. Yeah. Works with me. Well, grab my stickers a little bit. Oh. Yeah.
Is this video going to be somewhere for us to get? Yeah, to? it'll be on iHeat.com. iHeat.com. Hopefully, sometime uh, early next week. Okay. After it gets edited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to edit out some stuff. <laughs> yeah. The points will also. I can also give you a copy. Yeah. Blue mark. Pretty great. Yeah. There's a big one. Blue mark right there. Oh. Yes. That's a good question. Oh, questions? A lot, no. lot to play with. Wow. If you haven't this been to Adrian's website, I highly recommend it. Thank you. 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 It's just a lot to go through. And there's a lot more to the subject matter. Oh, yeah. Like I said, I've talked about some of the failures using some of the uh, automated social search engines. I was expecting to actually get better results back on some of those people. And I have in the past. But then I go back later on, and maybe I was using a different engine. I didn't get good results. But I think we got some decent results in the Google hacking section. Yeah. Yeah, you used to be able to get to the back of servers with Google hacking, and you go in there, and people leave messages and files. Oh, don't worry, ever I got their... Oh, yeah. I already emptied your PayPal account and all sorts of things. Crazy crazy when, sorry, when Service Sniff is behaving better, check it out. It is a really neat tool for profiling uh, IP addresses and domain names. Okay. Anybody else? Are there are uh, any looks to uh, incorporate Wiggle or iGiggle, either one, into the Android? Not directly, I suppose it's doable. Uh, I'd have to look into, uh, I'd have to look more into Android programming. The next tool I would really like to mess around with is um, stuff that I like, take all these different social sites and make something like what these people are trying to put out that's not working for me and put it out there for free and just make money off the ad revenue. It's good. So you can leave someone out there not willing to sell their. Oh, there's two things I should mention. I want to, uh, I can't see the email. Could you turn that up? <laughs> Thank you, that's good. Uh, a couple tools I didn't mention. On my phone, there's several uh, neat apps you can use. One of them is called Wikitude. The other one's called Layers. And they'll actually uh, geolocate stuff that's nearby where you're at currently. Uh, i got to go in and turn on my Wi-Fi again. Turn on my Wi-Fi. Then i got to go in and probably turn on my geolocation settings. Let's see. i got to turn back on my GPS. Turn off a bunch of stuff because I'm not actually using it while I'm in the building. Okay. Hopefully, eventually... Actually, now that I think about it, I'm not going to be able to pull this up because I can't get a network connection in this thing. But uh, Wikitube is pretty neat. You can actually go in there and pull up Twitter and Foursquare feeds. And you can look at a map like this on your phone. I think there's a version for iPhone OS and I iOS as well as for Android. And you can sit there and look at where people are on the map, but you can also flip it up and do an augmented reality view. And when we walk outside later on, I can try to show it to you out in the open where I can actually get a GPS signal. And you can look around and see people who have been tweeting and using Foursquare all around you. There's a and it gives you like a distance to them, an so augmented reality. There's an app I use on it that's uh, uh, along the lines of more driving than that that will actually... Shows you the the basin of uh, you know whatever AP is around you, and then there's another screen then where you can go to the radar and it'll actually show you Wi-Fi full phone. I, that might be. I don't have my phone with me. If I'm using the iGig. Wiggle actually has its own uh, Android tool now, so you can automatically uh, upload your stuff. Sweet. Or you can do a capture then upload it to them later on. Now the bad thing about it, I'm pretty sure it's only uh it doesn't find SIDs that are cloaked. Okay. Not that sick loading is necessarily that great a security feature anyway, but it doesn't find those. But it's just so convenient to use. I'm going to wiggle on Yeah, on unless, unless you're in the uh, car. And it makes it things convenient. Charger. Makes it hard to... Okay, anybody else? You guys done this in. I wrote the dates for the next three workshops. Uh, Total Ivy coming up in the uh, uh, Yes. Well, no more questions. I'm going to uh, shut things down and give people copies now if they don't want to wait till Monday. Yeah, yeah. And uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, for thank you, Adrian. Thank you.